you've been labeled with things you don't have. You are not as sick or as pathological or as diseased or as dysfunctional as you think you are. You may be a few nutrients away from being the most optimal person that you ever imagined. Gary Breck is a human biologist and researcher who is the co-founder of 10X Health System. Along with a wide-ranging team of experts, his focus is to uncover the safest and fastest way to optimize your mind, body, and spirit. So if we can just improve the nutrient deficiencies in the human population and get hormones to improve and get oxygen up in these bodies, we can literally improve the mood of humanity. He spent over two decades studying when and how we die, pushing him to focus on how we should live. I just said, what the hell am I doing? I'm not gonna spend one more minute of my life predicting when people are gonna die. I'm gonna spend the balance of my lifetime helping people live healthier, happier, longer lives. And it's astounding how acute and sharp and focused and aware people are about their business and how completely detached most people are from the temple. Apply that same zeal and intellectual curiosity to your body and you can entirely change the trajectory of your life. Daikon is a show where we learn life lessons from those who may shape the icon in each of us. Today we jump into the fascinating world of mortality and optimal health. There are four things that you could do for free that would entirely change the trajectory of your life. And you could start doing these tomorrow. I'm gonna write these down too. <laughs> Gary Brecka, welcome to the Icons by Motiversity. Hey man, it's super good to be here, man. Thank you for inviting me. I mean, this is an honor for us. We've been listening to your work. It feels like every time I hear one of your clips or interviews, I just find myself like immediately compelled by it. And, and What's fascinating is that I'm drawn to the optimal health stuff, but I'm also, when I first came across you, I heard you talking about some of the data that you had access to when you were in the insurance industry. And really being able to kind of almost, you know, forecast when somebody would pass to the month. I mean, yes. how has that shaped what you do? You know what's amazing is is uh, I get a lot of flack for that actually online and, and um, a few times I've done some interviews where we've gone really deep into that science, but the science of mortality is some of the most accurate science in the world. Um, if you look at, for example, you know uh, all of the financial services instruments that are actually based on death, that are based on when someone is going to leave this earth, annuities, reverse mortgages, uh, life insurance, you know, in in these kinds of financial services transactions, of which there are hundreds of billions per year, only one variable matters. Um, and if you, you know, how many more months does this person have left on earth? And everybody that's listening to this podcast is on an actuarial curve, right? If you're a 24 year old female, you have a life expectancy of X. If you're a 54 year old male, you have a life expectancy of Y. But when an insurance company is getting ready to take 10 million or 25 million or, or $50 million worth of risk on your life, they don't care where you are on an actuarial curve. They want to know specifically how many more months does this person have left on earth. And if you want to know how accurate they are at doing this, and just look at what happened during the 2008-2009 financial services crisis, right? We had 364 banks fail. You didn't have a single life insurance company fail, not one. In fact, the credit derivatives division of AIG, one of the biggest um, life insurance companies in the world, went under. It was the life side that bailed them out. And... You know, remember that insurance companies have data that no other financial services enterprise has, no, no college university, no research study, not even the federal government. And that is that they know the day, the date, the time, the location, and the cause of death for hundreds of millions of lives. And they not only have that point of death information, right, because you have to file a, a death claim, but they also know that person's medical records, they know their demographic data, they have, if you've ever taken out a very large life insurance, and I'm not talking about if you take out a term life insurance policy for $200,000. I'm talking about a permanent whole life or universal life policy. Um, you know it's a pretty invasive process, right? They, they get your trust, your states, your bank accounts, brokerage accounts, all your tax returns. I mean, they look at your divorce decrees if there's one of those. I mean, it's, it's a very, you know, invasive, uh, you know, proctology exam. And, um, and then of course, you know, they also get blood work on you. And, you know, what was fascinating to me was that, you know, that database, if it could see the light of day, it would permanently change the face of humanity. 
I mean, it would upend modern medicine in a way that would be catastrophic. You know, we know that we know the trajectory and the etiology of every pharmaceutical compound. If you're on a statin, you know what are the al- what are what are the byproducts of that? What does it do to hormone disruption, cellular wall metabolism? What does it do to the production of vitamin D3, and eventually, what does it do to the immune system? If you're on corticosteroids, you know how do how do these um, anti-inflammatory compounds that ad- initially reduce inflammation? How do they eventually eat the joint like a termite? Um, you know, we knew about the addictive amyloids and opiates before opioids um, before long before the opioid crisis, and because we had data, um, you know, you look at how they're treating, um, you know, uh, multiple vaccines and multiple boosters and table rating these policies. Even without asking that question, they have this data inside of your medical record, and so it's very accurate science, but. You know, I did this for so many years that eventually I started to realize that, um, you know, this was not just data, um, that there was a human being on the other side of the spreadsheet. And, you know, the majority of the reason why the people that I was doing life expectancy predictions on were not living healthier, happier, longer, more fulfilling lives were for things that we called modifiable risk factors. And had I just been able to pick up the phone and talk to that person, you know, on average, I, I could have added about seven years to their life. And, you know, that began to weigh on me pretty heavily. And I was restricted by law from having any contact with the patient, any contact with the treating physician. So even if I saw a life-threatening drug interaction, I, I couldn't I couldn't contact the patient. And so eventually I, I just decided I was not gonna spend one more month or week or day or hour uh, predicting how soon people were gonna die. And I decided that I was gonna spend the balance of my adult lifetime helping people live healthier, happier, longer lives. And so I'm not a physician, I'm a human biologist, I'm not licensed to practice medicine, but I did read medical records eight hours a day, six days a week for almost 20 years. So, so I've read thousands of times more medical records than most physicians because they're practicing medicine. And so you know, we were spotting trends and looking at the etiology of a lot of chemicals and synthetics and pharmaceuticals on human beings. And also looking at what ki- types of genetics and what types of uh, blood work markers would set people up for the onset of, the severity of, and eventually how soon they would succumb to disease or pathology. Wow. I mean, I've, I think I'm struck from a couple of different angles on that. Like, I think the clarity of working back from death is just really fascinating. You know, obviously the insights that you get from that, but then also the drive of just like, fair enough, all that in, those insights exist. But like you said, there's human beings on the other end of that data and no they've got lives to live and there's things that could help them. Um, you know, when I describe that you've kind of made this shift from focusing on death to focusing on life, how do you describe what you do? Well, I mean, you know, so let's take, for example, um, you know, the fact that over and over and over and over again, one of the things that we would see was um, what we call iatrogenic illness or, um, you know, medical misdiagnosis. You know, in the United States, medical error is the third leading cause of death. And I mean, there was a 2016 Harvard study. It was repeated in 2019 by Johns Hopkins. The study actually got worse. Um, so, you know, the only thing that kills more people than medical error is cardiovascular disease and, and cancer. And when you think that modern medicine's errors are the third leading cause of death, um, that is astounding. But it's even more shocking when you realize that um, the third leading cause of death is the industry trying to prevent death. I mean, if you translated that to any other industry, it would it it would be laughable. I mean, if you were a uh, you know if you sold home security systems, but you were the third leading cause of home invasion, or if you um you know you were a roofer and you were the third leading cause of roofing collapse, um you know I don't think you'd be in business very long. And it just it spotlights that modern medicine does enormous amount of good. So does big pharma, but the the. The end result is that, you know, this is not the place to go for optimal health, it's the the place to go for crisis medicine. You know, we're very good at crisis intervention. I mean, if I hit a windshield at 20 miles an hour, I want a surgeon, I want, you know, I'm going to the ER, I want the pain medications, I want it all. Um, You know, if you're gonna deliver a baby, you you wanna deliver it in the sterile OR and you want an OBGYN there and you want the right drugs and you wanna be dilated and you wanna be, you wanna have the pain medication. But when we talk about a state of optimal health and we look at the crisis of chronic disease, 
um, you know, heart disease, autoimmune disease, cancers, um, you know, type two diabetes, mor morbid obesity. We start to realize that, especially in the United States, spending does not equate to outcomes. We spend $4 trillion, you know, multiples more than any other country in the world spends on healthcare. We're ranked 32nd in the world in the delivery of healthcare. We're ranked 59th in life expectancy. And so what we're, we're doing is we're being, you know, when we, we barely move the margin on cancer and autoimmune disease, um, we barely move the margin on cardiovascular disease. And, you know, when you start to realize that it's these modifiable risk factors that could entirely change the trajectory of people's lives. You know, I, I, every time I get on a podcast or stage talk or I have an interview, I always say the same thing. If I could boil my entire career down to a single sentence, it would be that the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. You know, we didn't find a single disease etiological pathway, not one, that wasn't having its roots in a lack of blood oxygen or wasn't exacerbated by blood oxygen. In fact, you know, anemia, hypoxia, we call it. In fact, every single human being leaves this earth the same way. We all die of the same thing. The definition of death is lack of oxygen to the brain, hypoxia. But we tended to think of it as an event, a gunshot wound, a bus, a stroke, a car accident. But the truth is, this is a predictable curve. Either we are managing oxygen well or we are managing oxygen poorly. The more poorly we manage oxygen, the faster we are accelerating, not only towards the grave, but towards all cause mortality. One of the reasons why sedentary lifestyle is the leading cause of all cause mortality, meaning sitting is the new smoking, is because it reduces the oxidative state. We know that aging, we know that disease is a progressive mitochondrial disease. It's a, it's a dysfunction in the powerhouse of the cell called the mitochondria. And the more that we can feed this mitochondria and properly power it, its favorite fuel source is oxygen, the longer we're gonna live, the healthier we're gonna live, the more cognizant we're going to be, the less disease prone we're going to be. And you know, the second real fascinating sort of Perry Mason ta-da moment for me was that the majority of the reason why people are not living healthier, happier, longer lives are simple nutrient deficiencies. We are nutrient deficiency and deficient. And when you have a deficiency in the human body, you get the expression of this disease. You know, I remember when I was of disease and pathology, and I remember when I was in um, grad school and I was getting my second biology degree, my second one in, in human biology, and I had to take all these plant botany courses, um, which I hated, but you, you have to take them. And I'm like, you know, I'm getting a human biology degree here. What, what, what am I doing studying, you know, azaleas and rhododendrons, but <laughs> you have to take them. But you know, what was, what was fascinating to me was that it doesn't matter what goes wrong in the leaf or the trunk or, or, or um, the branches of a tree. If you had a palm tree and the leaves were rotting and you, and you called, or they were diseased, and you called a true arborist, a true botanist out to your house, they wouldn't touch the leaves of that tree. What they would do is they would core test the soil. And when they got those results, they would say, hey, th there's no nitrogen in this soil. And they put nitrogen in the soil and the leaf would heal. But we've stopped thinking about human beings this way. You know, as soon as something goes wrong, you know, and we would want to spray poison on it or cut the leaf or trim it or skin the bark or take off the, the branches. But the truth is when you deprive the human body of certain raw materials, you get the expression of disease. So for example, one of the most common misdiagnoses that we saw was, it was prolific was that, you know, people that had a, a prolonged deficiency in vitamin D3, the most important nutrient in the human body, right? The only vitamin that human beings make on our own. We actually only make a single vitamin, right? If I was to pull your blood work right now, you'd see that you have hundreds of vitamins in your bloodstream. You're only capable of making one, and it's vitamin D3. We make it from sunlight and cholesterol. Um, so when you're deficient in this nutrient, right, this vitamin, it also works like a hormone, um, all of a sudden, after years and years and years, you will begin to present to your doctor with rheumatoid arthritis-like symptoms. Now, you don't have rheumatoid arthritis, but your history is identical. You know, the soles of your feet and ankles are sore and achy when you got out of bed in the morning. You get sick more often. You wake up sore and achy like you had a workout the night before when you haven't. Um, eventually, it moves up to stiff shoulders and hips and your, your, your neck begins to ache. And eventually, it's kind of hard to make a really tight fist. You give that scenario to the wrong physician, they're gonna say, you know what? You've got rheumatoid arthritis. I'm gonna hit you with some high dose prednisone. I'm gonna put you on something called a corticosteroid. It's gonna take all the pain away. Well, a corticosteroid is, a, is an anti-inflammatory, which initially knocks down the inflammation, 
but eventually it eats the joint like a termite. And so what happens is six years and one day after you start these, you're having a joint replacement. It was so consistent and so reliable that if you were a 60 year old female and I saw you were misdiagnosed with rheumatoid because you had a vitamin D3 deficiency, I would artificially advance your age six years and one day, I would schedule the joint replacement for you. I would then, after the joint replacement, start to reduce what's called your ambulatory profile, how well you moved how well you ambulated. As I reduced your ambulatory profile, I could bring in all of the diseases that exacerbate with reduced mobility. So now you were diagnosed with a condition you didn't have, put on a medication that wasn't needed, which led to a surgery that wasn't required, which took diseases from your future and brought them forward. And you actually succumbed to a disease you never should have had because you had a surgery that you didn't need because of a med medication that wasn't required because of a condition that you never had. And I could give you dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of this. And it's not that physicians are sinister or big pharma's out to kill us. It's that, you know, in, in, in this voluminous healthcare world, we just, we don't have the time to take an in-depth look at, the, at, at patients. You know, we, the average physician has seven minutes to spend with a patient. And so we quickly do the best of our diagnoses. And then we put people onto this track of disease. And we used to call them anchor diagnoses because once you're diagnosed with hypertension or hypothyroid or autoimmune or Crohn's disease or, or rheumatoid arthritis, you are forever that patient. Five years from now, you go to see another doctor and he looks at your records and says, oh, you're hypertensive. Oh, oh you have rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, you have um, uh, type two diabetes. You have you know, th uh, thyroid disease. You have Crohn's disease. You have autoimmune condition. And they will never go back and check that diagnosis to see if it was properly validated. And so now these people get into a hamster wheel and they just continue along with chemicals and synthetics and pharmaceuticals that are just, um, you know, eroding the, the life out of them in many cases. Wow. I mean, I feel like, I feel like there's about, I don't know, a dozen things that came up in that that I want to really unpack with you. I mean, yeah, I'm even caught at that first line where you're talking about th the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease, if I got that right. And I, I feel like, you know, words like oxygen, vitamins, I mean, this is stuff that six-year-olds know, but somehow about the big storyline of oxygen, we're missing. Why, why do you think we don't know the power of oxygen, even though it's so familiar to us? Well, you know, in my opinion, um, we've lost a lot of faith in mankind and humanity and the body's ability to heal itself, right? The ability of this to heal this right? Mindset, frequency, nutrients. Our soil is so nutrient depleted. You know, our, we, we are chemically um, slowly poisoning ourselves. You know, there's fluoride in our water, there's chlorines in our water, there's microplastics. There's, you know, we use glyphosate to spray crops and, glyfo and, then, and glyphosate started to kill our seeds and started to kill our crops. So then we genetically modified the seeds so we could be resistant to glyphosate. And so a lot of times, you know, instead of just fear mongering, I just say, we have to get back to the basics right? Aging is the aggressive pursuit of comfort. And we too aggressively pursue comfort nowadays. We have to stop telling grandma not to go outside. It's too hot. Not to go outside. It's too cold. Just to lay down, just to relax, to, to eat at the very first pang of hunger. This is just collapsing our natural defense mechanisms, right? And we have to understand that not all stress in the body is bad. In fact, a lot of stress is very good, there's a process in the body called hormesis, where if you actually stress it, it strengthens in a positive way. You know, remember, if you don't tear a muscle, it won't grow. If you don't load a bone, it will not strengthen. If you don't challenge the immune system, it will weaken. You know, you're seeing the results of this coming out of a global pandemic. I'm probably going to lose half your audience now by saying this next, but I'm going to say it because it's by position. You know, one of the worst things that we ever did was residential quarantining, masking, and social distancing. Because what this did was it took human beings out of contact with other human beings. And you're seeing the weakening of the immune system, a global collapse of the immune system. And now you hear all kinds of things. Monkeypox, uh, eighth iteration of Omicron. We're on our sixth or seventh booster now. And why does the immune system need that much support? It's because we weakened it, right? So Aging truly is the aggressive pursuit of comfort. And I believe that people need to get data on their bodies and then put a plan together for their body like they do their business. You know, it's interesting how many entrepreneurs I talk to. And sometimes when I'm on a stage talk, I'll invite a really successful entrepreneur up on stage and I'll sit down with them and I'll say, hey, um, how much money did your business make last month? 
Oh, uh, $662,000. Wow. Um, what was your net income? 148400 How many employees do you have? 17. What's the revenue per employee? 71200 Um, What's your hemoglobin A1C? What are your testosterone? Where's your testosterone level? Um, do you know what your insulin is? No idea, right? So we know more about our business than we know about our own biome, than we know about our own temple. And we think because we're young, we don't need data on our temple. That is not true. We should start to get data and gamify life. We should start to look and see, wow, I'm deficient in vitamin D3. Um, there, are, there are genetic tests that you can do, cheek swabs that you can do. You can look at the five actionable genes, five of the actionable genes in the human body. And you can see how is, what are the things that my body can process and what are the things that it cannot in other words, there's not a single compound known to mankind, not one, that we put into the human body that is used in the format that we put it in. Without a single exception, everything that enters the human body has to go through this conversion process to be converted into the usable form. So for example, we put folic acid into the human body. Folic acid is a useless man-made chemical we make in a laboratory. We've been lied to and told that, it, that it's a natural vitamin. Folic acid does not occur anywhere naturally in nature. You cannot find folic acid anywhere on the surface of the earth. But when we put it into the body, the body takes it and converts it into methylfolate. Now, all human beings can use methylfolate. 44% of human beings have a gene mutation called MDHFR that doesn't allow them to convert folic acid into methylfolate. So now what happens when they can't make this conversion? They have a deficiency. And it's this deficiency that leads to the expression of the most common ailments we suffer from as mankind. So what happens when you pull methylfolate or, or the complex of B vitamins or specific forms of B12 like methylcobalamin, simple nutrients, what happens when you deplete these from a human being? Well, the first thing that happens is they have an inability to methylate certain neurotransmitters. So understand that, you know, in the United States, we define depression, for example, as an inadequate supply of serotonin. So according to this definition, I don't happen to agree with it, but if, according to this definition, if you're low on serotonin, you're by definition depressed. So you would think that the fix would be to raise serotonin, but that's not what we do. We take people that are low on serotonin and we put them on SSRIs, select serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which rations what little serotonin they have. So by definition, it never raises serotonin. So by definition, it never ends depression. I talked to a client yesterday and I said, how many years have you been on antidepressants? And she said, 21 years. And my first question was, well, when did you think it was gonna kick in? Um, and if, so if we understand that serotonin is actually made in our gut, 90% of the serotonin in your body is here. If you don't have it here, you can't have it here. So. Now the question becomes, what do I need to make serotonin? Well, you need an amino acid called tryptophan, and we methylate it into the neurotransmitter serotonin. You need a complex of B vitamins, you need methylfolate, you need um, B12, you need zinc, you need magne magnesium. If you're deficient in these raw materials, you are now deficient in the main neurotransmitter responsible for mood, for emotion. You know, we don't have a mental illness crisis. We have a lack of mental fitness crisis. Right? And I could give you disease after disease after disease. You know, people are diagnosed with all kinds of familial or genetically inherited conditions that do not have a gene that corresponds to that condition. So hypertension runs in families. You're not passing hypertension from offspring to offspring. You're passing the inability for the body to refine a raw material, causing a deficiency in that family that is leading to that disease. And so very often, if we want to lower our blood pressure, for example, um, we can look at how well we metabolize something called homocysteine. So if you're deficient in these methylfolates and these B vitamins and these B12s and the zincs and the magnesiums, you're not able to lower these inflammatory compounds. And what happens? They rise. When they rise in the bloodstream, they irritate the arteries. What happens when you irritate an artery? It clamps down. So if you make the pipes smaller in a fixed system, the pressure goes up. And yet we examine the heart, there's nothing wrong with the heart, but the pressure is still high. And even though we can't find anything wrong with the cardiovascular system, we still medicate the heart. We hold it responsible for a crime it's not committing. Only 15% of hypertensive diagnosis have a reason. 85% of them are unknown origin. 
And yet we don't look to nutrient deficiencies to say, hey, what could be missing from this person's biome that could be causing it to behave that way? Very much back to the, the nitrogen analogy. Um, you know, if you didn't find the nitrogen deficiency, the rot in that leaf never would have healed. You could have put sulfur and you could have put, you know, manganese and you could have put, um, you know, uh, salt, peat moss and watered it and everything else. If it didn't have that nutrient, you're going to get the expression of disease. And so, so many human beings are dealing with things that they are chalking up to a consequence of aging. And they are one or two or three simple nutrients away from being optimal. They have no idea how good it feels to feel normal. Right? And clients say it to me all the time. They're like, oh my God, Gary, I've been working with you. I feel amazing. I'm like, look, you, you know, not to burst your bubble, but you don't actually feel amazing. Um, you feel normal. I mean, this is, that's what normal is supposed to feel like. Um, you were just nutrient deficient. So you thought that weight gain and water retention and brain fog and poor sleep and poor focus and concentration and, and uh, you know, a very poor response to exercise was normal because you were stressed or your kids or your spouse or your age or any number of other nonsense, you know, reasons, but you were just nutrient deficient. Um, sorry, I feel like I've really- No, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm like mentally taking notes and, and you can probably see me writing as we go. You know, we had an interview a little while ago on the show with a doctor, she's 103 years old, remarkable. Her name is Dr. Gladys McGarry, and she was the, they consider her the mother of holistic medicine to the point where when she was getting into it, I mean, they had to decide how they were gonna spell the word. Holistic didn't even exist then. And she, wow. she, yeah, it was amazing, amazing. And she's still practicing to this day and so sharp. But she was describing how there's a healer within and there's a healer outside of our body. And, and talked about that awareness that is so important with our own, in our own bodies. And it sounds like when you're talking about, you know, getting back to simple things, I mean, these are words that we all know, but maybe we just haven't thought about them or we haven't dialed in or we know the numbers of our business, but not of our bodies. It sounds like there's a real starting place that just kind of goes back to foundational ideas, but with a bit more of an awareness of maybe where those foundational ideas are getting blocked in the body or getting caught in the body. I mean, there's two tests that I think every human should do. You know, number one, men, men or women, um, you should get a blood panel done, um, comprehensive metabolic panel, what's called a CBC, com, um, complete blood count, a lipid profile, a hormone panel, and then some basic nutrient deficiencies, vitamin D3, B12, DHEA, um, and, and take a look. In fact, I'll post on my Instagram, the, the blood panel that we pull. I'm we're in the States, you're in Canada. So, you know, I couldn't see any of your listeners, but, um, and, and show you what we pull in men and women. And this gives you a good casting net, like a good idea. Where are my sugars? Where's my insulin? Where's my triglycerides? How's my cholesterol? Um, how are my hormones? And you get this data and the majority of people that have low hormones or elevated cholesterol or, or um, other markers in their blood don't need hormone therapy or medication or synthetics or pharmaceuticals. They need nutrients in order to fix this. For example, if you deplete the D3 and the DHEA from someone's body, you will deplete the level of testosterone. It will look like they are hormone deficient, but they don't need hormones. They need the two raw materials, D3, cholecalciferol with vitamin K2, and they need um, DHEA. You put these two raw materials back into the body, it starts to function like the well-oiled machine that it was designed. And you see people with high homocysteine, they take another amino acid called TMG, trimethylglycine, and it brings their homocysteine down and all of a sudden their blood pressure goes to normal. Well, you actually never had um, a cardiac issue. Your EKG was normal. Your EEG was normal. Your heart and lung sounds were normal. All your advanced studies were normal. You had high blood pressure but you didn't have the hypertension diagnosis. You just had high blood pressure because your vascular system was contracted. And so, and, and these are generally harmless ways to neutrify the body and then get out of its way and watch it do um, the most magnificent job you can imagine. And the second one is a genetic test. Um, there are five genes that I think we should look at in the human body. And you can do this as early as your kids can chew and swallow. Um, and your listeners may want to write these down because I'm sure there's places in Canada where you can get these kinds of tests done. I'm, I'm going to write these down too. <laughs> yeah. That is the MTHFR gene, the MTR, MTRR, A-H-C-Y-N-C-O-M-T, COMT. Look at these gene breaks. 
and you can supplement for their deficiency. I'm not saying there are not other genes you can look at. I'm also not saying this is the entire genetic code or everything that you need to look at to see if you have a Parkinson's or, or a BRCA um, gene for predisposition to breast cancer. There's, there, you could get lost in the human genome, but this is your starting point, these five, because these are the major genes of methylation. These are the major genes that are converting raw materials in the human body into the form that you need. And then you can begin to supplement for deficiency instead of for the sake of supplementing. You want to see magic happen in a human being? Supplement their body for the deficiency that they have and not just the sake of supplementing. You know, when I go to most people's supplement cabinets and I open it, and I'm like, oh, there's St. John's wort and salt palmento and CoQ10 and vitamin C and a multivitamin. Like, whoa, like there's a ton of stuff in there. And most of the time they don't know why they're taking it or what it's really designed to do. They read an article or they saw something on Instagram. But the truth is before you go down the road of whether or not a supplement is good quality or not, or it's manufactured in the right facility or it's of the right certain potency, you should ask your body, you should ask the question, does my body need this? Right? That should be the first question, right? Not is it a good quality vitamin or nutrient, but does my body need it? Because if you don't take what the body's deficient in, all the supplementation in the world will do you no good. As soon as you hit the deficiencies, this is when magic happens in the human body. This is when hormone balance returns. You know, and if you think about it, I'm low in vitamin D3 and I'm low in DHEA. So now I'm low in two basic nutrients, which has actually drugged my testosterone down. And the primary role of testosterone in men and women, believe it or not, is not male characteristics. It's not deep voice, facial hair, aggression, muscles. It's none of those things. The primary role of testosterone, one of its primary roles, is to put pressure on the bone marrow to make new red blood cells. So this is called erythropoiesis. So now I'm deficient in DHEA and D3. It's drug my testosterone down. My testosterone falling is taking the pressure off the bone marrow. The bone marrow's dropped its production of red blood cells and hemoglobin. Why is that important? Because a red blood cell carries oxygen inside of a fluid called hemoglobin. And so it's inside this fluid that oxygen is bound. If I lower the number of red blood cells or I lower the amount of hemoglobin, I am dropping the oxidative state in the blood. So what profile do these people have? They're exhausted, they're tired, they have brain fog, um, their short-term recall is starting to go. And this can happen to you in your 30s or even your late 20s, by the way. This is not reserved for old people. And so when our, our hormones drop because of nutrient deficiencies, our bone marrow's production of red blood cells and hemoglobin drops. Now we have a low oxidative state. Well, guess what else cause, uh, guess what else oxygen is necessary for? Every elevated emotional state. If you look at passion, elation, joy, arousal, libido, all the sort of hell yeah, I won the lottery emotions, the really elevated emotional states, they all require oxygen as a part of their molecular structure. So when you're in a low oxidative state, you've now missed out on the upper tier of emotion. So mood starts to flatten. Well, now all of a sudden you let this go on for a few years and now you have a mood disorder. Now you have ADD or I'm being, saying you're being diagnosed with these. You don't have any of these conditions. You have ADD, you have ADHD, you have OCD, you have manic depression, you have bipolar, um, you have a mood disorder, you have depression. Um, you, you get into the state we call mood numbness where the peaks and valleys of mood disappear. What if it was as simple, and it may be, I'm not saying in every case, as going back into your body, getting the data and saying, well, what if I raise my D3 and my DHEA, my testosterone recovered, and it put pressure on my bone marrow to produce more red blood cells and fill them full of hemoglobin, and I bound more oxygen, and I got more energy, my short-term recall started to improve, and my deep sleep came back. Because everything that a human being um, experiences about energy, everything that you call energy, energy is nothing more than oxygen in your blood. If you told me Gary had a lot of energy today, physiologically what you're saying is, I had a lot of oxygen in my blood today. So if oxygen equals energy, which it does, then if I wanna raise your energy level, I have to improve the oxidative state of the blood. One of the reasons why no human being has ever woken up laughing is because you don't have the oxidative state in deep sleep to come out and experience laughter. Can you, you, know, can you wake up angry? Yes. You know, in fact, you want to do a fun little experiment tonight. Just pinch your spouse while they're in a deep sleep. They will instantly wake up angry, right? Because anger, jealousy, despair, resentment, these emotions do not require oxygen. You can be in a deep sleep and instantly wake up angry. So 
because it's, it, so these are readily available emotions. So if we can just improve the nutrient deficiencies in the human population and get hormones to improve and get oxygen up in these bodies, we can literally improve the mood of humanity. I know that sounds a bit far-fetched, but I mean, that's really kind of my mission in life is to just get the message out there to people that, listen, you are not as sick or as pathological or as diseased or as dysfunctional as you think you are. You may be a few nutrients away from being the most optimal person that you ever imagined. The, I think that line around, you know, how much energy do I have today? And that's directly related to your oxygen. I think that's just so, I mean, people can grab hold of that. It makes so much sense in terms of- Yeah, I mean, that's what we call a runner's high. I mean, that's why people love cold plunges. That's why people love, when what's happening in a cold plunge, right? You got a peripheral vasoconstriction. Where's all that blood go? To the core and to the brain liver, lungs, pancreas, kidneys, and up to the brain. So what's actually happening? You're getting an artificial concentration of oxygen up to the brain. What's the brain do? It releases endorphins, pleasure hormones, dopamine, which lasts six to eight hours. You know, cocaine lasts nine minutes, right? So, so, and cocaine's very expensive and will end up killing you, right? And a cold plunge is, you know, in a cold shower is free, and will change the trajectory of your life. But people don't want to do it because aging, aging is the aggressive pursuit of comfort. You know, I tell people there are four things that you could do for free that would entirely change the trajectory of your life. And you could start doing these tomorrow because, you know, we were meant to spend 85% of our time outside as human beings. That's how we were engineered and ancestrally. And we now spend more than 95% of our time indoors. We regulate everything, our lighting, our temperature, our humidity, everything. And so if, if you started tomorrow doing four simple things, um, a few days a week, taking your shoes off and contacting the surface of the earth, earthing and grounding is a very real thing. Like walking on the, on the surface of the earth is what you're saying. Yes, but I'm talking about dirt, grass, sand, right? Not, not, not pavement or you know concrete, pavers, not walking outside on your on the balcony of your condo. I'm on the 30th floor of a condo right here. Um, if you don't have a PEMF mat or want to invest in a PEMF mat, for which is about five grand, for free, you can take your shoes off, you can contact the surface of the earth. Earthing and grounding is a very real thing. Human beings build up a charge. When we build up this charge, we discharge into the earth. You want to change the polarity in the body, right? We talk about pH, potential hydrogen being acidic or basic. If you want to shift the pH of the body, you don't drink alkaline water. That's the biggest marketing myth ever sold to the public. You contact the surface of the earth. You run a low Gauss current through the surface of the earth. The surface of the earth is magnetic. It has a low Gauss current. And if you, you can go to my Instagram at Gary Brecca. I actually posted a video where I held the polar end of a, uh, a meter and I plugged the other end into the, into the ground and I stood on my tennis shoes and the meter was resting on the post. And as soon as I stepped off my tennis shoes and touched the surface of the earth and completed that circuit, it pegged all the way over to the right. So earthing and grounding can change the polarity in our cells. It'll actually re, it will actually recharge the surface of our cells so they repel one another and are not oppositely charged and attracting to one another and sticking together. If you look at red blood cells under a microscope, when they get opposite charges, they attract. Everywhere they touch, you lose surface area. Now that cell cannot exchange with the outside environment. It can't eliminate waste, repair, detoxify, or regenerate. So. Touch the surface of the earth. That's the first thing we get from Mother Nature is magnetism. The second thing we get from Mother Nature is oxygen, right? We get oxygen from the air. And so it's about 21% O2 at sea level. So get outside in the morning and do three rounds of 30 deep breaths with a breath hold in between. Just get the oxygen in. Don't worry about whether it comes in through your nose or your mouth. The style of breath work that I personally use is one called Wim Hof. He deserves all the credit. Um, you can His videos are free online all over the place. There's Wim Hof coaches all over the planet. You can go to my Instagram and I do breath work tutorial videos. Touch the surface of the earth, do eight minutes of breath work, expose your skin to sunlight during the first 45 minutes of the day. Why is that important? Because first light is the most beautiful, beneficial light of the day. It has healthy blue rays of light. Um, you will generate vitamin D3. You can actually take your shirt off um, and expose it to sunlight. There are no harmful UVA or UVB rays in the first 45 minutes of the day. And then when you're done and you're ready to shower, when you're done showering, take a cold shower for 60 
minutes or 60 seconds to three minutes. Now, there is a lot of fancy, I actually sell a protocol called the superhuman protocol. It's $150,000. It is a PEMF mat, a hypermax oxygen system, and a red light therapy bed. For You can spend $150,000 on that, or you could get every single one of those things for free by doing just what I said to do. Touch the surface of the earth, expose your skin to sunlight, learn to do a round of breath work, and take a cold shower. I mean, it is amazing what this does for human beings, this hormetic stress, filling the body with oxygen, changing our mood, elevating our emotional state, um, resetting our cortisol and our melatonin receptors with first light in the morning. There's enormous amounts of evidence on this. You know, using what God gave us in the natural circadian cycle of the earth and the sun in order to put us back into a healthy biorhythm and recharge us. We are photovoltaic beings. Sometimes we're indoors so often we go six days a week without even getting any sunlight on our skin. The truth is most of us are not getting enough sun, not that we're getting too much. And so the simple things that we can do like that, um, getting tap water out of your life for good, you know, I'm not, not drinking chlorinated or fluoridated fluoride laden water. You know, I don't know whose idea it was to take fluoro salicylic acid, the byproduct, the waste product from phosphate fertilizer production and put it into our drinking water under the guise that it's good for our teeth. That is the most absurd thing I've ever seen. If, in fact, if you look at the back of a toothpaste label, it even says that if you swallow this toothpaste to contact poison control immediately, why don't I contact poison control every time I have a glass of tap water? You know, so I should get tap water out of my life. Um, so simple changes that you, you can make, you know, non-GMO foods, getting tap water out of your life, avoiding seed oils, breath work, grounding, sunlight exposure, cold showers. None of these things will add a single dollar to your budget and could entirely change the trajectory of your life. I mean, you're talking about some of the words that would be people respond to this immediately. Mood, depression, ADHD, tiredness. Like, I mean, yeah. and, and it feels like you're seeing, or at least, uh, I'm curious, what are the... What's the potential in that? Like, are we seeing people kind of feel like, you know, I've got a bit more energy or are you actually seeing like significant changes based on work that feels intentional, but, but quite um, accessible for everyone? Massive, massive shifts. I have a, um, a, a it's, it's currently an anecdotal study, but about 17,000 um, patients that have come through our clinic system. We are, we're sanitizing this data. We're gonna feed it through AI and we're hoping to publish it in a very large peer reviewed um, journal. Um, backed by a very, very, very well-known Ivy League university. Once this is published, it will actually put a lot of what I'm saying into the light and allow it to go under scrutiny so that you know the medical community and the scientific community can evaluate this data for the first time. But you know, essentially, these nutrient deficiencies that are leading to the expression of disease, you just said ADD or ADHD. I mean, if you think about how many people are either listening to this that are suffering from ADD or ADHD or know somebody who's suffering from that. It's, I bet it's more than 70% of your audience either suffering or know somebody who's suffering. So if we actually talk about what that is, right? What is ADD or ADHD? Well, first of all, attention deficit disorder is not an attention deficit at all. It is an attention overload disorder. It is too many windows open at the same time. You see, people with ADD and ADHD do not lack the ability to pay attention. They lack the ability to pay attention to so many things. So what happens is there is a category of neurotransmitters in the blood that are, and in our brain called catecholamines. Catecholamines are fight or flight neurotransmitters. And understand that in the human brain, we don't just create thought, we also dismantle thought. We break thought down. If not, we would always be in the same mood, right? So if, like if you're in an average mood and I walk up and I put a little puppy in your lap, that's a stimulus. You get all lovey-dovey, coochie, coochie, scratchy, scratchy, um, you know, and this is a beautiful, cute little puppy. And I feel this motion of like lovey-dovey and then you take the puppy away, my mood goes back to normal. Well, how does that happen? Well, the neurotransmitter cascade that created that mood when the stimulus is removed is degraded, so your mood returns to normal. So in, um, in people with attention deficit disorder, they are actually creating thought at a faster rate than they're breaking thought down. So now the mind gets clouded, right? So instead of putting 
Raw materials, nutrients, L-methionine, magnesium, zinc, B-complex, methylcobalamin, folate, methylfolate into the body so that they can actually degrade these neurotransmitters and return that thought and, and expire that thought from their conscious. What modern medicine says, well, if the, if the mind is racing, let's put an amphetamine into the body to race the central nervous system to match the pace of the mind. This is what Adderall and Vivans and Ritalin are. They're amphetamines. So essentially what's happening is we're racing the central nervous system to keep up with the mind instead of just breaking thought down naturally and quieting the mind. You see, the reason why somebody with ADD or ADHD can be thinking about a job they're working on and then having their friend walk up and say, so I'm thinking about a job, then they start talking to their friend. And while they're talking to their friend, they, they look at a logo on their jacket, which reminds them of a vacation they want to take. So now they're thinking about a job, talking to their friend, looking at a logo, thinking about a vacation they want to take all at the same time, right? And then when the friend tries to engage them in conversation, they're not paying attention. So we call it an attention deficit disorder. But the truth is they were paying attention to too many things. So as soon as you start to quiet the mind, this, this condition eviscerates. In many cases, it eviscerates. Um, and so um, things like folic acid, um, you know, 44% of the population has this MTHFR gene mutation, which means they can't process folic acid. Well, what do we feed kids in the morning? Pop-tarts, white bagels, cereal, um, breads. Um, so now we pump these kids full of folic acid. Their mind starts to race. It's a full contact sport to get them in the car to go to school in the morning. Then as soon as they get to school, the call comes home. Little Johnny can't pay attention. He's disruptive. He doesn't follow directions, doesn't finish this assignment. We need to bring in the Ritalin, you know, the Ritalin to solve this. The truth is we don't need to bring in the Ritalin. We need to get out the folic acid and maybe supplement this child with methylfolate, which you can do for young children. It's very safe. And watch their behavior change in seven days. It's amazing how many moms and dads are like, oh my God, I got a whole new kid in the house after I got folic acid out and started taking methylated gummies. Um, it's like an entirely new child. And this is true for anxiety. This is true for depression. This is true for all kinds of mental conditions. OCD, you know, people that have obsessive compulsive disorder have an obsessive compulsive reason to control their outside environment. Because when you lack organization in your inside environment, you crave organization in your outside environment. And we call this obsessive compulsive disorder. It's not an obsessive compulsion at all. It's a disorganization internally that can be fixed with nutrients. Same with anxiety. You know, when, when somebody has anxiety and you ask them three questions, you can prove very quickly. I mean, 64% of Americans anyway report either consistently suffering from or at some point during their life suffering from anxiety. You'll never convince me that 64% of people have anxiety, but I know that they're experiencing this. It's because we don't really understand the genesis of what it is. Like, what is it? Besides it being a fear of something happening in the future, what it is is it's a rise in this neurotransmitter category called catecholamines. And once we understand that as sophisticated as our brain is, it truly does not know the difference between perception and reality, right? I always use the example, you could drive home tonight and you could get out of your car and somebody is, uh, let's say, standing in front of you with a knife. Well, that's a very real fear. So you would start having a fight or flight response. Catecholamines would flood your brain. Your pupils would dilate. Your heart rate would increase. Your extremities would flood with blood. You would start having this fight or flight response. But I'm on the 30th floor of a condo building. You could be laying in my bed tonight and you could start thinking about getting eaten by a shark. I promise you the chances of a shark getting out of that ocean and coming up that elevator are zero. But you could have the exact same reaction how is it that you have the same reaction to the presence of a real fear as something entirely imagined? Because at the core, they're the exact same thing. They are catecholamines rising in the brain. So let's say that you have a gene mutation, C-O-M-T, COMT, and you cannot break down these catecholamines. So slowly they rise, right? And so now all of a sudden you begin to feel fear without the presence of a fear. We call this generalized anxiety, which is generalized nonsense. We, we, we say that these, um, you know, true anxiety is I have, a, I'm a fear of heights. I walk to the edge of a 30th floor balcony. I freak out. I'm afraid of, uh, you know, claustrophobic. I step on a crowded elevator. You know, I, I, I have anxiety, but not just sitting here like us, you and I on a podcast right now and starting to be overwhelmed with anxiety not driving home from work on an otherwise innocuous day and being overwhelmed by anxiety. This is coming from within you, not from a cluster of symptoms outside. 
And this is why most people that have anxiety have had it on and off throughout their entire lifetime. That's your first sign, it's a genetic mutation. They cannot point to the specific trigger that causes it. That's your second sign that it's not really anxiety. And if they've ever tried anti-anxiety medications, they don't work, they just make them feel like a zombie. There's your confirmation that it's not truly anxiety, it's coming from your physiology. So I want these people to be filled with hope, not fear and despair, and think that they're trapped in this for the rest of their lifetime. Get the nutrients into the body for it to do its job, and this is when the magic happens. I think you just caught the attention of a lot of people with what you were just saying there. You know, I've, I've also heard you talk about weight loss and stuff like the 30-30-30 rule. Can you let me know what you're learning on that front? Well, 30, 30, 30 is, you know, is my invention. That came from Tim Ferriss. Um, he wrote a book called The Four Hour Body. Um, he's an amazing author. He's an amazing human. Um, I don't know him personally, but I'm a huge fan of his work. He's a, kind of a silent mentor of mine. Um, he also wrote uh, League of Titans, which is an amazing business book. Um, and, um, and so in, in, in The Four Hour Body, you know, one of the things that he said was that, you know, one of the most astounding ways that we found to burn fat was uh, getting 30 grams of protein within 30 minutes of waking, followed by 30 minutes of steady state cardio. I have actually tried this in thousands of clients and had astounding results. So um, like, I'd love to take credit for the Brett, you know, it's Wim off. I mean, I'd love to take credit for 30, 30, 30. Sorry, Tim, you, you, you earned it. Um, or credit to Tim, you earned it. But um, uh, so 30 grams of protein within 30 minutes of waking followed by 30 minutes of steady state cardio. I mean, there was 30 or 40,000 people around the world that did it as a Gary Brecker 30, 30, 30 challenge. And I felt bad because I didn't actually start that challenge and it was Tim's idea and I was like, <laughs> but people ran with it and lost tons of weight. And it was, so, you know, it, it went viral on the internet. I just did a three day water fast. I haven't eaten for three days. I'm on day three right now. As you can tell I got a lot of energy. I've just been drinking oxygen water um, and uh, hydrogen water. Um, but I took 50,000 people through a three-day water fast um, day before yesterday, yesterday, and today um, to just really show them how to harness the power of the human body to cleanse itself, to actually turn on itself and eat the most useless portions of the body first, you know, what we call senescent cells and zombie cells to actually restore the, the sensitivity to our insulin um, and to, um, you know, lower our blood sugar, burn a little fat, clear our minds, you know, void our, our, our gut and allow the body three days to repair, regenerate and detoxify, um, and, and, and really repair itself. So we're at the, we're at the tail end of that three days now, we're about 70, 72 hours in. So tomorrow, tomorrow morning, I'll have my first first bone broth to break the fast. But you know, there's, this is such an amazing machine. It's such an incredible chemical factory. And the, the mind has such influence over the health and the activities and the synergy going on in this body. You know, we, we're realizing now that we used to think that we only use 10% of our brains, but the truth is the other 90% of our brain is constantly in touch with 32 trillion cells every millisecond. Only this past year did the computing power of all of the iPhones in North America surpass the computing power of the human brain. It is an astounding machine. And if we actually would spend more time studying human beings, mankind, human physiology, we would realize that we can actually tap it to heal itself, can heal the world around it, and to function a lot more optimally. Can we touch on alcohol for a second? How dangerous is it? Um, well, so there's no safe level of alcohol. I mean, the truth is that, you know, all of the myths about, you know, a glass of wine a day or a shot of whiskey a day, look, that's not going to kill you. But, um, but there isn't any health benefit. You know, we, we, we would point out that, well, red wine has resveratrol. Well, you can also get resveratrol from the skin of red grapes and you get 400 times the concentration in a capsule. Um, you know, and it's not really the alcohol. It's what the alcohol becomes, right? So alcohol is... is um, you know, processed through the liver and becomes something called acetylaldehyde. Acetylaldehyde is a poison. It's what actually makes your brain hurt. Um, it dehydrates the, the lining of the brain called the dura, which is what gives you a headache. By the way, headaches don't come from the brain. The brain doesn't have any pain receptors. It's not actually capable of transmitting a pain signal. We get the pain from the covering of the brain called the dura. And the dura hates two things. It hates being stretched and it hates being contracted. And so when you look at alcohol, um, by far the best alcohol, if you're gonna drink alcohol, people either love me for this or hate me for this, um, is tequila, 
right? It comes from the agave plant, slowly metabolized through the liver. It has the lowest amount, you know, it's processed into acetylhaldehyde, but at a much lower rate. Um, it creates a lot less inflammation. Ounce per ounce is probably the healthiest, if to use that word, you know, form of alcohol. Lots of alcohols come from grains, potatoes, hops, barley, and these are horrible sources for alcohol because they create a lot of acetylaldehyde, and they also create they also put a lot of folic acid into the body, um, which forty four percent of us can't process. Um, so my preference would be no alcohol, but you are going to drink alcohol if you can drink tequila. That's the best. Um, after that, it would be full body bold red wines, not from the United States because they're very high in sulfites, preferably French. And then, and then way below that would be clear alcohols and then everything else. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, the French are probably cheering you on with that, that final statement about wine, but I think- Yeah, I hope the French got a spike in- I mean, It seems like fascinating research that's coming out about alcohol. I, I want, there's a bunch of questions that we ask all of our Icons guests, but there's also, you know, yeah, as you mentioned at the top, you're not a doctor, a medical doctor. Um, how do you how do you balance? I mean, obviously you've got a ton of research behind you. I can just you know, hear the depth of knowledge, but also talking about topics that would touch in kind of the, the medical field. How do you balance that when you do this work? Well, first and foremost, I'm, I'm, I'm very forthright about saying that, you know, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not licensed to practice medicine because I'm not. And the people that earned the right to do that should get the credit for doing that. Um, so what I've been able to do is train a huge army of physicians, MDs, um, um, PhDs, nurse practitioners, you know, um, registered nurses, PAs. Um, you know, so my, I started a company in, you know nine years ago when I left the uh, life insurance industry. It was called Streamline Medical Group. Um, at the time, um, we started treating a, a, a well-known billionaire in the United States named Grant Cardone, um, who ended up acquiring us and we became the 10X Health. Um, 10X was his brand. So he acquired us, we became 10X Health. You know, since then we ballooned to, you know, um, 130, 140 employees in you know, offices all over the country and, and a very strong medical team, clinical team. Um, and I've had the blessing of training them and they practice medicine. And so, um, you know, it's 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 not inappropriate for me to share my research or ideas or trends or my opinions on things. It's very inappropriate for me to give medical advice. And so, what I do is I try to train as many practitioners as will listen, and um, and then they will go out and shift the way that they practice medicine because they're looking at the human body in a whole new light. Um, I also believe in freely giving of the information. I don't like give specific recommendations. I mean, that's the practice of medicine, but certain talking about human physiology and what kind of nutrients we can put back into the body um, that could possibly eviscerate a lot of these conditions that we have. You know, I don't say that I treat hypertension or treat hypothyroid or treat anxiety. What I say is you've been labeled with things you don't have. You, you, you know, you've been told you have ADD or ADHD. You have, you have an inability to degrade neurotransmitter. You've been told that you have a sleep disorder. You can't downregulate catecholamines. You've been told you have anxiety. You have an overexpression of catecholamines. You've been told you have hypertension, but no doctor could get you the evidence of hypertension. All your diagnosis was, uh, was normal. So maybe you have hyperhomocysteinemia. And you can lower that. So rather than say that I would, you know, I treat or cure a disease, which would be a complete fallacy, um, I say, look, maybe you should look for the nutrient deficiencies in the human body and you've been this mislabeled as having a pathology or disease that you might not have. Um, and so I, I hope that that, you know, distinction comes across because I, I certainly am not down on medicine or, 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 or MDs or the people that actually put in the work to get the license that have actually earned the right to practice medicine. Um, but most people got into medicine to do the right thing. And then they got into a system that didn't allow them to do that. Um, so, you know, my company is becoming a platform for people that want to get out of that system and get into the optimal health system. Um, and outside we need, we need an army of people to become citizen scientists and kind of take their, their, um, their journey of optimal health into their own hands. Understand a few biomarkers in your blood, a few genetic markers in your genome, and, and start to understand how I can actually use this data to, to, to improve you know, the entire trajectory of my life. And, and that's what's gonna be required because we cannot leave that in the hands of modern medicine. Modern medicine is excellent at crisis management, um, um, but it is, you know, has proven not to be the best choice for, for 
you know, in the search for optimal health, anti-aging, longevity. I appreciate you sharing that and, and, and how you see your work and the distinction. I mean, it, it, it feels, you know, it was interesting. I mean, lots of it feels similar to what I was hearing from Dr. Gladys in terms of that awareness and that, you know, taking on the, uh, I don't know, giving yourself permission to take ownership of, of your health in that regard and really pursue. No question. Yeah, it's, it's powerful. And, you know, you- and, and getting data, right? I, I, like the, you know, the example I gave with the entrepreneur, you know, was, was to sort of shine a light on, look, when, when you started your business, you probably didn't know what an income statement was, a balance sheet, a P&L, right? Um, and now you do. And you understand all of these details about your business and you're really good at it. Um, so apply the same thing to your body. Maybe you've never heard of hemoglobin A1C. You don't know that that's the three month average of your blood sugar. Um, maybe you don't know what DHEA is, but that's okay. You know, there's a few biomarkers you could educate yourself in, hey, these are the kind of the parameters of what's going on in my body. If I wanna operate a business, I know I got a top line, I deduct my cost of goods sold, you know, and then I've gotta pay taxes. So we start to understand what are the metrics that are important to the success of this business. You can do the same with the human body. Some basic metrics, you know, your hormones, your, your lipids, you know, your, your nutrient deficiencies, um, what's called a CBC, a CMP, you know, my liver function, kidney function, there's, a, there's certain basics. And you could, not to practice medicine, but you could understand what these basics mean to your future, just like you understand how your balance sheet, your P&L, and your income statement are needed, that data is needed to operate your business. And it's astounding how acute and sharp and focused and aware people are about their business and how completely detached most people are from the, from the temple, right? Which is, this is way more important than your business. This is the, this is the only vehicle you have. And it's gonna get you and your family and, and the world you're trying to touch and your product or service and everything else where it, want, where it needs to go. So this should really come first. So just apply that same zeal and intellectual curiosity to your body, gamify your health a little bit, and you can entirely change the, the, you know, I say it all the time, the trajectory of your life. I can imagine a lot of entrepreneurs and business people just, just heard that message loud and clear. You know, you've been talking quite a bit about your optimal health work that goes this way, I mean, towards others. How about the work that you do towards yourself? I mean, how are you practicing this? What are your routines, your rituals that you find are the most powerful for you? So, so this might sound very selfish, but um, I, I give the first 90 minutes of every day to myself. Um, and I am absolutely resolute about that. Um, I'm, I'm resolute about self-care. My wife teases me about it all the time. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, first of all, I schedule, I schedule flights and meetings around, um, you know, exercise and sleep. Um, I don't schedule, um, my sleep and my exercise around meetings and flights and, and other commitments. I mean, I have an enormous mission in this world. I believe this is God's calling for me. It's my passion. I know that this is my purpose and it's easy for me to get consumed. So when I wake up in the morning, I mean, I have a very exact routine that I go through. I'm happy to share it with you. Um, so I wake up in the morning, I splash water on my face, I brush my teeth um, and I immediately walk over and I get into a cold plunge. Um, I have a cold plunge in my um, uh, you know, outside of my master bedroom. And I kind of use the David Goggins uh, method, which is like, if you know David Goggins, um, you know, you can solve anything with massive action. Um, and so I stand at the edge of it and I used to negotiate with myself. Now I don't, um, because I would say, well, maybe I should get my coffee first. Maybe I should do this. So I walk in there and get straight into a cold plunge. For the record, you could also do it with a cold shower. Um, I'm gonna tell you my routine. I'm gonna tell you how could do, you could do what I do for free. Um, so I get out of the cold plunge, I dry off, I put shorts on and in the next room I have a treadmill and I get on a treadmill and I walk um, for three minutes, sprint for 30 seconds, walk for three minutes, sprint for 30 seconds, walk for three minutes and sprint for 30 seconds. I'm done at 10 and a half minutes, but I, um, I'm using a Hypermax oxygen. I actually put an, um, an O2 mask on and I'm breathing 95% O2. This is called multi-step oxygen therapy or EWOT, exercise with oxygen therapy. Um, fascinating research done by Otto Warburg um, on, on this and just the benefits um, for human beings. So now maybe 15, 20 minutes into my morning, I walk down the hall, I get into a red light bed for 10 minutes, a Theralite 360 red light bed, then I have coffee and I go outside and I do eight minutes of breath work. Um, and then on the days that I'm working out, that's when I head to the gym. 
Um, and it's simple. It sounds like a lot. Um, it's three or four things all lined up in a row. I can tell the days that I do it and the days that I don't, but I expose my body to cold. Um, I breathe um, oxygen on a treadmill. Um, I get in a red light bed for 10 minutes. I have coffee. I do breath work. I'm only 30 minutes into my day at that time. And it's easy to go right down to the gym. And then by the time, you know, I'm back up from the gym, um, you know, an hour later, I shower and I start my day. And, uh, and I do that religiously every day. And when I travel, um, the one thing that is always, always, always consistent, never, ever, ever, ever miss, can't emphasize it enough, is I do eight minutes of breath work within 30 minutes of waking every single day. I will miss a commercial flight not to miss breath work. It resets your circadian rhythm. If I can, I expose my skin to, to sunlight at the same time. If you actually just make little promises and keep little promises to yourself, it is amazing what it will do for your confidence level, your self-esteem, because most of us will do things to ourselves that we don't do to the outside world. We'll say, hey, I'm gonna go to bed at 10 o'clock tonight. They get in bed at one o'clock in the morning. I'm gonna go to bed at 10 o'clock tonight now. I get in bed at 11.30. Um, I'm going to work out the first thing tomorrow morning. I get up, I get on my phone, and I miss the workout. You keep breaking promises to yourself. And that is the most detrimental thing for our psyche. When you lose confidence in yourself, which you will by not having a routine and breaking little tiny promises to yourself, um, now you can't exude confidence and authenticity to the outside world. And you pay a price for that. As a, as a frequent traveler, I, uh, I, I'm definitely hearing that advice about the breath work in the morning. I think yeah. that's, yeah, no, I appreciate that. You know, it's, um, yeah, I can appreciate how you describe that there's, you know, the machinery that helps you have that routine, but there's also the, the free version of that. And, and, you know, both can be powerful. When you think back, I mean, the, the again, the research that, that you've built over time, but when you think back to y you at a younger age, 20 years old, what advice would you now give your 20 year old self? You know, it's interesting because if I took the advice that I'm about to give, I probably wouldn't be where I am. So it's kind of a conundrum because, you know, I was very inauthentic for many, many years of my life. I, um, I really, desperately wanted to be wealthy. It's really all I wanted to do is to get rich. Um, I was making decent money in the insurance industry. Um, I was not in the service of humanity. Um, I was in the service of myself. And um, I was predicting when people were gonna die, not helping people live healthier, happier, longer lives. And it wasn't until that massive Perry Mason moment in my life where I just said, what the hell am I doing? I'm, I'm not gonna spend one more minute of my life predicting when people are gonna die. I'm gonna spend the balance of my lifetime helping people live healthier, happier, longer lives. And ironically, it was at that moment that I stopped thinking about being wealthy and I started thinking about other people's well-being. And the more I delved myself into other people's well-being, the wealthier I became. And so that was a really hard journey for me. I feel like I have a huge hole to fill. Um, because I spent an enormous amount of my adult lifetime um, not in service of humanity, not really making a difference, not really creating any kind of legacy, not really making any kind of impact. But at the same time, I guess it was that education during that 22 years that really allows me to be in service now. And so um, I would say, um, you know, the greatest moment in life for me came when I realized that I would otherwise do this for free, and now I've somehow monetized it. And the amount of humility that comes from that and the lack of my pursuit of money any longer and the, and the absolute passion I have for what I do, um, I, I don't mean to sound altruistic, but you know, it's, it's like when, you're, when the purpose is bigger than any problem, um, life becomes very easy. And so, you know, a lot of times when I wake up, I don't know if it's gratitude or prayer, but I, I, I actually take them, I, I thank God. And I'm like, I don't want anything else. Like if you just keep it right here, right? I'm literally, I don't want any more money. I don't want any, you know, I don't need any more exposure. I don't need any more strokes on the back. Like I, I, I absolutely love the lane that my life is in. I have no aches and pains. I feel great. Um, you know, I'm thinking clearly, I, I know that I'm making an impact and I'm absolutely passionate. Like this podcast right now does not feel like work to me. 
like I'm getting high from this. Like I, I, I get, I get a rush from this. Um, so I don't know if I gave you a direct answer, but that's my answer. <laughs> I appreciate the answer. Gary, what legacy do you hope to leave behind? You know, um, the legacy's already begun because, you know, my greatest blessing in life, um, again, not to sound too altruistic, is my children. And my two oldest children work for me full time. And when you actually see your children adopt the passion, because you can teach your kids anything, you cannot give them a passion. And I feel like the only thing you can't fail at is being a parent, right? That's, that's, that's the... That's God's reason for putting you on this earth. And the only way that you're ever gonna have a legacy is to actually leave a legacy that, that you, you respect. And so my two oldest children work for me full-time. Um, they're both in school full-time. They work for me full-time. They really got that bug. My two youngest children, which are still in, in, in school, they, um, um, they're on this trajectory too. I see how they conscious they are about their choices and conscious they are about their, their lifestyle. And to me... When your children start to inspire you and you, um, you are propelled more for the will to gain their respect and their confidence, to me, that's the pinnacle of life is to have children that you respect more than you respect yourself that actually you know, hold you accountable. You see that you're raising human beings that were better human beings than you were. Um, for me, that's the greatest satisfaction from, um, in life. And I know now that I'm gonna leave, leave a legacy because my children are following in the same footsteps, they're making the same impact and sometimes in a, in a greater way than I am. Um, for me, that's been the greatest part of this entire journey. You know, I realized that at 25 years old, which my oldest daughter and 22 years old and 19 and 15, you know, ex with the exception of the 15 year old, at this point, if you look at statistics, I'd be seeing these, these kids four or five times a year major holidays, you know, weekends, they would be off doing their own thing. I see them every single day. I talk with them every single day. We have real information to share, real clients that we talk about, real lives that we're impacting. That is by far the greatest thing that's come out of this journey for me. That's, that's really powerful. You know, I've had the I've had the opportunity to, to follow your work in preparation for this interview. And so I've, I've seen the reach you now have uh, so this is a big question, you know, what, after all that you've been doing, what do you feel like is next for you? Um, you know, the, the hard part is, you know, is, is, is to have to say no more, more often. And, you know, the, the difficult part is that my circle is actually getting smaller, not, not larger. Um, because when, you know, when you started, you were a lot of one-on-one -on -one and a lot of, you know, you had a lot of contact and you had a lot of um, individual lives that you were able to change. So I still, I will never, ever, ever stop doing that. I still see clients privately, um, invite them into my home and give them a half a day because um, that is really the chicken soup that for my soul. But, you know, like Grant Cardone told me, you know, if, if you can't get somebody to take action, you can't change their life. And so I've shifted my gears to trying to be educational in a way that inspires people to make a transformation so I try to give them enough education and social media is a really interesting place because you have a very short period of time to grab someone's attention. So I want to educate someone enough to inspire them to actually make a change, right? So, you know, I know that it's, you know, my job is not to prove to you how smart I am. My job is to impact the masses, is to, is to educate and inspire the masses to the point where they actually make a change. Like hopefully on this podcast, People go, you know what? I'm going to try the breath work and the grounding and a little bit of sunlight and a cold shower tomorrow. I've done my job. You know, initially I, I was in, 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 in a partnership where, you know, my partners would say, Gary, you give way too much information away on podcasts and interviews and, and stage talks and everything else and on your own podcast. And I'm like, look, we have to understand that this information doesn't belong to us. It certainly doesn't belong to me. It belongs to humanity. And so I'm blessed enough to have it flow through me. And as long as I continue to, to wake up and go to bed in that vein, that I'm just a vehicle, I have a, I have a, 
I have a superpower to take the ultra complicated and communicate it in a way that the masses can understand and hopefully in a way that inspires them to make a change. They don't need to spend a dollar with me um, or with my company or with anything I'm connected to. They just need to make this transformative change. And that's the way that we change the world. We have to give without the expectation of receipt. You know, and what's crazy is as, as that mind shift happened to me, I became wealthier than I ever imagined. And now the last thing I think about is the wealth and it comes in abundance. And I think it's because, you know, that universal law of attraction says, you know, when you're in service, um, and this is when you're in your, your highest frequency. And so, you know, for me, it's about continuing to just get the message out and be in service. And if you ask me a question, I am going to give you as thorough and complete an answer as possible without regard to whether or not it has a direct benefit back to me or not. I think it's a hard concept for a lot of entrepreneurs. It was impossible for me for 22 years, um, which is maybe why I'm so committed to it now. I, I can imagine this, um, you know, what you covered today landed with a lot of people and, and that ability to, to, and that willingness to give, I think uh, comes through loud and clear in your work. I, I know you have to say no to a lot of people, but you said yes to us and we really appreciate yeah. you joining us on the show. Thank you, Gary. You're super welcome, man. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Hey, Icons community, I'm Tyler Way host of The Icons, and I want to thank you for choosing to listen to this podcast. We know there are lots of great options out there. And our goal with this show is to learn from the world's leading minds, athletes, business people, culture shapers, and creatives about what it took to achieve remarkable accomplishments. Then we figure out how those valuable lessons apply to each of us. For those who don't know me, I'm one of the owners of Motiversity. Along with the founder, Joel Hucklock, and our team, we are YouTube's largest motivational media company. So welcome to the Icons, where we dive deep into the wisdom, motivation, challenges, and triumphs of those who've done extraordinary things. And in these conversations, I'm still learning, just like you. I also wanna ask you for a favor. We're so fortunate to have the guests that we do on our show, and it's because of the reach and dedication of our Motiversity community. So if you're just coming across this channel, we'd appreciate if you'd subscribe and stay tuned. We've got some incredible things coming up, and there's no doubt the best is yet to come.